Okay, so names. Uh, nodes, topics, they all have names. Um, so the idea there is that you have, say, this localization system that's taking in laser scans, odometry, and maps, and putting out um, robot poses. The idea is that you have multiple ports. Um, you can connect them to each other at runtime. Uh, the, you can put them into namespaces. So say you have actually two laser scanners, like on the bottom there. You, they're identical, they run the same driver node. You, would, you want to be able to distinguish the messages that they're outputting. So you don't want to have, um, say you have one on the front of your robot, one on the back of your robot. If they both were broadcasting to the topic laser, they would get all confused. And you wouldn't be able to have a way of distinguishing which message belongs to which laser. Instead, what you can do is we have this kind of colon equal syntax in the command line. And what that does is when the when node launches up, it replaces everything, the hard-coded strings called scan there in the laser driver, it replaces it with front laser. So you don't have to change the source code and recompile the source code because this can all happen on the fly. You can do it in the command line, you can do it in um, automated ways so you don't have to type these things all the time. Namespaces is an idea so that you can encapsulate the, the set of strings that things work with and so they don't crush other ones. Just like we like to have directories on file systems so that we can have multiple files named readme.txt. Uh, in this case, we can do the same thing with these nodes and topic names. You can push them all down into, into namespaces. We even use the, the slash system because the file system is such a good idea and it's been working so well for so long. We'll use it again. So the slash is essentially the namespace delimiter. Okay, so messages. Uh, messages are implemented by a code generator. This is one of the things we learned from the STAIR project. Um, you can write messages by hand uh, it's terrible. Um, it's just, I mean, you take, basically you, what you want is you have a small data structure. You want to then take that data structure and serialize it and deserialize it. Maybe make some MD5 sums to make sure it hasn't changed over time. Um, that's a great thing for a code generator to do. It's a terrible thing for a human being to do. We used to write them all by hand and um, it's just terrible. So anyway, so there's now, uh, in the ROS, we have 2,000 messages. I, I checked out all the ROS source code I could find on the internet and um, had my, some scripts sift through it. The interesting thing here is that graph on the right, so that, that's showing the, the number of data members in each message that I could find on all the ROS code I found on the internet. It looks like most of them are one, two, three, or four fields per message, which is great, because the idea there is you want to make it low friction to create new message types and to factor functionality into multiple programs. So we want to have it so that you can, if you have a particular data structure in your code, that looks like that's a logical place to kind of chop a program in two as the program grows. We want it to be easy to then make a new message type with that particular chunk of data in it so that you can then send it around. Um, that lets you have more small programs, which usually leads to finer grain debugging, load balancing across the system, and so on. So for example, we have a three lines of code there, that joystick message. Um, you know, it's an array of, of floating point numbers for the joystick axes and an array of discrete numbers for the buttons. And then you type in make, and then it'll spit out a thousand lines of code, which implement that data structure in you know, five or however many languages you have in, installed. So you don't have to do this yourself. And computers are great. They're very patient at this task. OK, so services. Um, I've been talking so far. Everything has been in data streams, which means you have a sequence of messages, one after the other, unidirectional on the connection. Um, sometimes transactions are more natural. And so at first, in the STAIR project, we would then have data streams pointing both directions. And you'd have kind of a state machine on one side that would take incoming queries and then, then push them back down. Um, that's fine, but it's even easier if you just want to have an object for that. So there's a thing called, called a service uh, that supports transactions. So uh, the kind of classic example for this is a knowledge base. If you want to query it, you can send a query to the thing, wait for a little bit, it'll send you a response back. And you just don't have to write the state machine yourself to handle the, the two data streams. Um, as you can imagine, with large distributed systems that are running on lots of machines in parallel, this can set up bottlenecks. You can imagine that every node wants to query the whole knowledge base at the same time. Basically, everything grinds to a halt until the knowledge base comes back. Um, so you know, it's a balanced thing. It sometimes can simplify code to your services, but the idea would be to don't, don't overdo it, especially when you have something that needs to get hammered a lot. It tends to be much more efficient to do that with the data stream. Um, process management. So we, the whole thing, as I've been talking here, is let's have lots of small programs to do a complicated task. It's terrible to have to launch them all by hand. Basically, you launch them all by hand kind of while you're debugging, and then um, it becomes not cool after like the first or second time. So, the idea, we, we can kind of encode all the things, all those little terminals that you would have, and you'd have your whole giant uh, desktop tiled with terminals. You can write all those in XML syntax, and then including all the parameters you're doing on the command line, all their node remapping, name remapping, all that kind of stuff, you can just put those in an XML file. They can include other XML files if you want to separate them out some functionality. And then you just have one shell command. So like ROS launch, PR2.launch, you hit enter, you kind of sit back for a few seconds, 
It'll then fork off 56 processes, which then spawn out 538 topics last time I checked this. The robot hand that I'm working on, um, it's a similar thing, smaller scale. So you just sort of hit ROS launch and, and 12 processes fly up. Equally important is at the end of the day, when you want to turn it off, you can just hit one control C and then it goes through and, and does the right thing. It'll first ask them gently to turn off. If the processes don't, it gives them a SIG term and a SIG kill as needed. Um, saves tons of time. So the idea here, um, abstractions, is that with time, uh, sometimes it's difficult to say what exactly the best way should be. So I brought the, I put the laser scan pictures on here because you can imagine there's a data structure that holds a laser scan. I could come up with one, you could come up with one, they could be equally semantically valid. Uh, there's really no difference between them. It's just they happen to use the data, like the fields are named a little bit differently. Um, maybe I have more comments in mine or something, or you have more comments in yours. Um, semantically, there's no difference. So. It, one, one method to do this is just to say by fiat, like this is the laser scan message and you will use it. Um, another way that we've found to be even more useful in the community is just to sort of let these things bubble up. And there's a, multiple schools of thought on that. Some people don't like this, some would rather sit, um, you know, the, the other approach would be to have a committee and to talk about it um, and to try to come up with something that is, that is clearly the best. That, that works for some projects. Um, what we're trying here instead is just to let these things happen and over time, uh, say there's a great uh, utilities that use particular forms of messages, everyone will just kind of migrate to that. If they are truly semantically equal and equally, uh, equally good technically, then that'll just become the standard, I guess, and we can adopt that over time. So I, I tend to kind of um, like this decentralized approach. That's what we've tried to push um, over time here. So with large open source projects, it's tricky. Uh, one of the trickiest things is, is to have everyone and meet the needs of contributors. So contributors need to find each other, first of all. Um, it's tricky over the internet because sometimes it, you know, we're, we're sort of separated by this email barrier. So it's hard to, to know who's working on what all around the world. It's great to have meetings like this because we can actually see each other as faces and as human beings. Um, but sometimes it's hard. And so the idea is that we need to have a way to, to find out what each other's working on, to publish each other's work, and to be able to say, if I'm doing some particular subtask, I'd like to find out who else in the world is working on that subtask and is there a way we can work together. So to do that, um, contributors also need to have credit for their own work and, and feel like they own it, because they should, because it's their own work, and then have licensing freedom as they say fit. So to, do, to, to kind of meet these goals, we made the ROS build system to be a feder what we call a federated build system, which means that instead of having one giant uh, code repository at, at one particular university or company, instead everyone can run their own code repositories, which is kind of the way that everyone does robotics right now anyway, so we just decided let's stick with that. Um, the parallel build system means that you can check out code from lots of different repositories, you type ROS make, and then it'll fork off a bunch of GCC jobs and, and try to make it somewhat efficient to build this, all these packages that you want to do. And then link all these packages together. If, if I'm using a, you know, some library that someone else has written at some other uh, institution that wants to tie it to mine, the idea is we try to reduce the friction in doing that. To make it easier to find each other, this ROS.org, I think we've, a lot of us have probably seen that. Um, there's a daemon that runs every night that goes and checks out all the robot code it knows about in the world that are registered with it. It crawls through that to find what packages are there. Uh, if there's built-in documentation it can find, that's great. If not, uh, it still tries to kind of pull out some keywords it can find in the manifest so that when you search for any particular widget, so if you have, want to have a new hardware driver for a new widget that you just bought, um, hopefully you can find that the ROS.org indexer will, will then help you point to someone that's working with that. Over time, the uh, number of packages has steadily grown. We're approaching the 4,000 package mark, which is very exciting. OK, so versioning. Um, this is something that open source tends to have a hard time with. And uh, we're certainly no exception. But we're trying to have a, a structure to kind of stabilize things a bit as we go forward. I talked at the very beginning about this paradox of you know we just want to work on our own stuff and have everyone else kind of hold still for a while. The way that we've tried to do this is a kind of delineating here between vetted software and what I like to call, I like to call it uh, wild software. So vetted software has gone through a review process, at, whether it's at Willow Garage or at other universities or wherever, or some combination, um, meaning that it does work. Um, it has things like unit tests. Um, it passes them. That's the idea. So it goes into there in the vetted software um, thing, and it gets essentially built up by the build system into apps packages on Ubuntu or other packages. Uh, essentially, we've tried to keep this lightweight so that it's, it's try to reduce the friction to publishing code. A stack consists of a bunch of packages with version number with the version number attached to them. So sort of like a collection of packages at one point in time, you sort of put a stick in the ground and say this is a stack and this is its version. Um, if you take a giant pile of stacks and put them together, then we call that a distribution. 
it seems like the, the Ubuntu model has been successful so far, and that's basically every six months they roll out a new collection of packages with version numbers attached to them. And so that's what we're trying to follow, is that, so if you can say that I want to develop for the particular distribution of ROS, whether it's this uh, eTurtle or Forte or whatever we want to do, and you can just sort of keep installing those app packages, and then it's guaranteed that for that particular distribution, we're not going to make breaking changes to it. And six months later, there'll be a new distribution which has new whiz-bang features, and that's great. You can upgrade if you want to, but you don't have to. And you can maintain your sort of your own leaf nodes and your own functionality without worrying that the, the world's going to shift underneath you. Um, the next part is this wild software. Um, I feel pretty strongly about this. There's about 2.5 million lines of code last time I checked it out. It took like two days. Um, my strong hypothesis is that any code sharing at all is better than no code sharing. So even if I wrote a program like two years ago and haven't touched it since, I do a lot of that, um, it's still better if it's out on the internet as opposed to being hidden uh, on my own computer. So if, even if someone writes something really cool, abandons it, it doesn't compile anymore, it's totally broken, that's still better than not actually knowing that it ever existed or no one ever looked at that problem before. And what we've found is that useful code eventually will find its way uh, into a vetted system. If, if you do write some, some whiz-bang feature, that's awesome. And even if you abandon it, odds are at some point, someone else working on the same problem will kind of find this thing and, and at the very least take your, be able to build on your ideas. Maybe not even take your source code, but build on the ideas and it is a positive thing. Okay, I also talked at the beginning about external dependencies and, and my, my problems with those in, in previous projects. Um, high quality open source code, code is out there. There's tons of it, it's awesome. Um, but it's, it's sometimes hard. It can get tedious uh, with all, trying to get all these dependencies. If you're trying to have version X of you know, this program and version Y of that one and keep them all compiling and building together. Uh, we tried to formalize this process a bit with ROS Dep. It just turns for ROS Dependency Tracker, Dependency Manager. So that um, one other thing that's interesting with Linux is that everyone has kind of their own names for things. So for example, if you want to install so you can compile against OpenGL, um, at the time that I made the slide at least, um, in Ubuntu, it was some obscure combination of GL and Mesa with dashes in between. Fedora, it's the same characters, but some of them are capitalized and switched around, um, and, and so long. Th this kind of repeats itself with lots of uh, dependencies. You'll find that the Fedora or Red Hat way and the Debian or Ubuntu way are basically the same, but different. Um, so we tried to have one, one collection. This is a bunch of YAML files that sort of store a semantic idea, like OpenGL, into the actual packages that that's needed on, on a bunch of different systems. The idea for doing this is that then you can say, I want to install all the dependencies for this package. So I can type rostep install rviz, and then it'll kind of grind for a bit, and then give you an apt get string that has like 50 packages you need to install, and you just hit enter, and it just goes. Okay, so now let's just dive in a little bit more. The minimalist scenario in ROS is if you have two nodes, one is publishing to another one. Uh, this is the very first uh, tutorial that we do, and I think a lot of people here are probably familiar with it. I'll just go through really quickly, um, just for those who aren't to kind of just show, the whole thing I want to show here is that it should be simple to do simple things. So this is a pretty simple thing. We want to have messages fly from one node to the other guy. So we worked hard to get this small. Um, this fits on one screen full, there's two includes. You have a little bit of boilerplate, but the idea again, as I said before, is that we're trying not to wrap up main. So the main function is very visible there, just like it has been since the dawn of prehistory. It, there's a bit of boilerplate, kind of instantiate a few things, a few objects, and then you just start publishing messages in a spin loop at the bottom. Um, we tried to keep this simple. Uh, I would love to even get rid of more lines in here. Feel free to please offer feedback if there's a way to, um, to get the simple example even simpler. I'd love that. The other side of this, now that's accepting these messages, there's a, this is doing it with the C callback type mechanism. You can also do C++. There are also more advanced languages out there like Python that do it even easier and more elegantly. Um, but the idea here is that you sort of have a little bit of boilerplate, instantiate a few objects, and then just callbacks start firing and you can do stuff. So that's the simple node. Um, there are, the ROS universe has tons of different nodes. There's a bunch of hardware driver nodes, as you'd expect, that talk to you know, tons of popular widgets that we can all buy as roboticists. Mobile bases, manipulators, cameras, laser scanners, all sorts of sensors. Um, they're all there, lots of them. It's kind of fun now. You can, oftentimes, if you want to buy a popular widget, you'll just go on ROS.org and type in the name of whatever widget you just purchased, and hopefully somewhere across the world someone's used it before and has, has wrapped it up. Um, to the tools, so we have kind of meta tools that can work with message streams, uh, like echoing or, or um, chopping up message streams, converting them from one format to another, uh, visualizing things, debugging tools, logging, uh, that's all great. Control either navigation systems, bridges to other control frameworks, um, perception pipelines, vision slam, 
you can never have enough OpenCV in a project. Um, it's great, just great. So let's see, cognitive level, uh, let's see, planning systems, reasoning systems. These are all kind of out there in the Ross universe. More of them show up every week, it's fantastic. And the idea being that if these sort of dynamic message networks like we're talking about, you can instantiate more of these things at the time, you can just kind of pull stuff up and, they'll, and hopefully they'll talk to each other and do reasonable things. So that was kind of a drive-by of a lot of ROS. So now let's just look at some awesome robots. The idea here is that I want to just show what people are doing with ROS across the world. Most of this stuff is pulled from the ROS.org blog. Um, but the idea would be that a lot of us, myself very much included, tend to work in kind of our own silo and our own problems, and it's easy to lose track of what's going on outside and to get ideas about what, people can, what you can do with ROS. So uh, we started out with what I like to call big bots. These are like human-scale things, lots of computers, lots of sensors. Um, the famous Pier 2 at UC Berkeley folding towels. Uh, similar platforms that are you know, similar but different, I guess, in terms of they're all human scale with most manipulators and lots of sensors on them all around the world. Small bots, I call a small bot a small bot if you can pick it up. So they're, typically these things are uh, mobile platforms with cameras on them, but there are certainly lots of exceptions like the Now platform that have lots of, lots of Dolphin can do neat things. Um, this, this class, at least, my classification of you can pick it up. It tends to run Linux on a network or a small form factor embedded system, but still runs ROS internally on the robot itself. Then we go down uh, to microbots, which I call it if it doesn't run ROS internally, but instead is tethered to a, a nearby Unix host. Um, so we have UPen does awesome stuff with these little modular widgets. Um, Lego NXT even can, you can tether that to a machine and have that bridge over to ROS. There's a whole different world here called ROS Industrial. They have a demo set up next door. Uh, so this is interesting because ROS has lots of cutting edge high level features in it. Um, we do all sorts of crazy things with connects and you have point cloud libraries and crazy stuff and planners and whatever and it's great. Industrial robots is kind of the opposite. It's rock solid low level controls, which means that they run 24 seven, 365, they never crash. They don't just like seg fault randomly and have to kind of reboot sometimes. They just work. Um, the idea of ROS industrial is to, to combine these two worlds and to try to get the best of both. Uh, hands, so this is sort of, uh, this hand um, on, the, on the right there is one I work on, so this is kind of a shameless plug here. Large wheels. Uh, autonomous lawnmowers is probably the most awesome thing I've ever heard of, so that's good. Uh, flying things, so the UPenn uh, quad rotors, if you haven't seen the videos yet, um, you must, like now. The, I looked at it last night, I think they have six million views, which is probably some of the most popular robotics videos of all time. Very, very cool. Uh, on the water, um, there's someone more athletic than I think all of us in this room, but that's okay. So, um, robots, you know, boats or sensor equipped devices. So simulation, uh, simulators, you can never quite have enough simulation. Um, the hardware development crowd knows this, and I think us in robotics are also trying to adapt it, grow, or pick up this viewpoint more and more, even with like high level um, abstract robotics, is that automatic regression testing is like the best thing ever for large projects, essentially. It's oftentimes hard to know. If you're working on one little module and sort of 20 connections away, if you've done something that breaks that other guy's code, it's hard to know that. And essentially what happens there is that there's a set of assumptions built into any software program. And the problem is if you don't violate your own assumptions, but you didn't quite communicate all those assumptions to sort of the rest of your team, and then one little tweak eventually will, will sort of cause us to, to all fail. Um, happens all the time in large projects. Robotics not being very, uh, not particularly novel in this problem. but Simulation from robotics is the, is the way to kind of fight against this. Um, so here's a plug for Gazebo, this cool video they recently made. Um, should you need to do like low flying radar avoiding thing through fractal terrains, you can do that here into evil lairs in the craters. Okay. So Gazebo's been around for a, a while. It is fantastic. Um, you can simulate all sorts of sensors on them. You can simulate laser scanning, um, reasonable physics. Popular robots they have already programmed up in there. Here's a PR2 and a KUKA U-Bot. Um, you can see you can manipulate the world. They manipulated models right there. And even complicated kinematic chains like a humanoid are being simulated here. Okay, so that was kind of where we are now in the Ross world. Um, now I'd like to kind of go off the rails a little bit and talk about some ideas for the future. 
Uh, just to be clear here, these views are my own. I don't particularly have any, um, I don't claim any sway, I guess, over, over disproportionate sway over the future of ROS, especially not for its contributors or their organizations. But with that out of the way, now let's have some fun. So uh, some of these ideas are kind of nutty. That's okay. Um, they, I'm trying to sort of set the stage here for lightning talks, that it's okay to look like a fool sometimes. So here's just three random ideas I have of things we can work on in the future. Uh, I call it super master, like a master of a master, essentially. Um, micro apps and an open dynamic firmware. That's probably the most crackpot of these, of these three ideas, and it'll be fun. So the first possibility here, super masters. Uh, ROS breaks if you can't talk to a master, basically. So by breaking, I mean that connections won't form and you can't find your peers. If you already are, know where your peers are, you can keep going, those data streams can keep going, that's fine. But if you, if you try to launch a new program and it needs to talk to a master to find out you know, who else there is, uh, that does not work if you can't talk to the master, obviously. So there's some situations uh, where that doesn't work. If you have multiple robots that are spread apart spatially in a building, of course we all know as roboticists that Wi-Fi is, we love it and we hate it at the same time. There's always, in any building, no matter how many access points you have, there's dead spots, so that's fine. Um, that's a problem then if you're in a dead spot, of course, because you can't find master and you can't find who your peers are. And even, even worse, if the master is running off of a mobile robot and you need to connect to something even on your own robot, if you can't talk to the master, you can't find out that that process is running on your own robot. That's a problem. So off-board computers, for the same reason, um, you can have similar problems. If you have a data, like a compute cluster, and you're trying to incorporate that compute cluster in your ROS network, you have to sort of choose one side or the other of that wireless link. You're gonna put the master on the mobile robot or the master's on the off-board cluster. Um, and so there's, there's problems with subnets on either side of those depending on, on where you are when the master goes down. Um, ambient functionality, like say you wanna have a robot that drives an elevator or turns light switches on or at least maybe even queries what state the lights are in or queries the HVAC system or whatever. Um, it's hard to say who owns that functionality. It probably belongs to the building, if anybody. Um, and so it's hard to say what ROS master that those functionalities should live in. So the idea here would be that master can connect to a super master. By that I mean it can subscribe to the sort of the information being propagated through a master one level above it, uh, which would then take a, the topic services parameters, the sort of all the, the state captured in that master would then propagate down somehow. And then it, of course to make it even more awesome would want to expand this hierarchy so you can have super super masters and all sorts of crazy complexity. Uh, if you do this somehow, um, fun things can happen. So we can have smart environments here. Where, so say there's a geo, geo reference with latitude, longitude, or Wi-Fi reference with MAC addresses, you can then query some central repository somewhere on the internet and say, hey, I'm in this particular building, meaning that I saw this particular MAC address. Uh, what is here that's interesting? You could then get back a response which has host name import of a public ROS master you can connect to there. And if you connect to that, then you can maintain or obtain ambient things from the building. So say like maps of the building. If a building is cool enough to have a public ROS master in it, it probably has been mapped a few times, so then you shouldn't have to map it yourself, basically. You should be able to download that stuff. Um, maybe download locations of outlets or charging ports, um, where the elevators are topologically in the building. Uh, maybe work the lighting systems or HVAC systems or other fun stuff. Um, that's one possibility. Another possibility, if you have a team of robots, uh, sometimes it's hard to say which, uh, you know, if you have a team, who should be controlling the other robots. So maybe you could instantiate a supermaster on one of these team members that's out kind of rolling around together, and that supermaster then can sort of run high-level programs which dictate behavior of the whole team. Uh, so the trick here, well, there's several, but um, one trick is that how do you sort of incorporate information from this other namespace without colliding in your own? Essentially, that's like um, if you were to take a whole bunch of directories and just sort of concatenate all their contents, you'd probably have name collisions. So maybe we can get around this by prepending um, that the dot dot Syntax has been around since sort of the dawn of time in file systems to say sort of go up a level. Maybe we could use that. Uh, maybe a reserved keyword or something. Um, another, other challenges are we need to have policies for data synchronization, meaning that when um, your supermaster has like more things connect to it, sort of at what level and at what frequency do you, do you propagate that down to the submasters? And then be able to similarly handle these dropouts or disappearances uh, gracefully. If the whole reason for using these supermasters is because Wi-Fi links go down, then we should sort of in the design of this thing build them together. Okay, so I'm not pretending to have the answers to these challenges at all. Uh, we can talk about them later, um, whatever. Okay, so here's another random possibility, uh, micro apps. Everyone loves apps. You just can't have enough apps. It's like the best buzzword ever right now. Um, why? I think there's a couple reasons why. It's Number one, it's easy to find. If I have a cell phone and I want to turn it into a flashlight, I can just search for flashlight on the Android store and there's like 500 results that come back. I can pick any one of them, click it, and like 30 seconds later I have the whole thing downloaded, installed, running on my phone. It's great, and it's very different from the experience that we used to have in software, of course, on, uh, on PCs. So the great thing about apps also, I think, is that they're limited to one task. 
Um, typically, if you download a little program like a flashlight on your phone, it's called flashlight, and you push it and it has like a big button and you do that and it does its thing. Um, they usually work meaning that you don't have to like look at the help file because they're so simple and the scope is so narrow that it, it does its thing. So anyway, I don't, I don't need to sell apps. Apps are great. Um, apps also tend to target virtual machines, which means they're much simpler to program. So instead of, uh, for example, just going back to this flashlight example, it's not actually looking at like the chain of microcontrollers on my phone and like what's the output GPIO and you know how do I toggle it and whatever. Um, instead, it's a virtual machine that it's hitting. And so it's making one call to the API layer to say, please turn on the LED. So in doing that, in sort of isolating the hardware and running everything on a virtual machine, it widens the pool of programmers because you don't have to have everyone be like you know, hardware software co-designers. And it's easier to maintain compatibility as, as you move the, the hardware forward, you can start, as long as you implement that compatibility layer, it, it'll all work. So the proposal here is that let's have these micro apps, they can live in a temporary namespace and then in that temporary namespace, we have a consistent set of topics. Like, for example, map. You just subscribe to map, you get a map. You subscribe to image, you get an image. And of course, there's lots of um, subtleties there. It won't be as good as a regular ROS node. Um, the trick here is there's a sort of inherent tension, I guess, when you're creating these app environments or, or programming frameworks in general of what is like simple, it's kind of just the right amount of simple, and what's too simple, and what's uh, too complicated. So that's, that's certainly tough, and um, would have to be iterated on, of course, I'm sure. Uh, security, Ross, uh, like I said before, wasn't designed with security in mind. You can always kind of cause mayhem if you, if you want mayhem. Um, but I think we can protect it at least against bugs, if not uh, genius malicious hackers. Um, by running these apps in a temporary namespace, and then if we add some functionality to the master so that you can't reach up to global identifiers for some programs. Um, and then also when you install the apps with some sort of manager program, you could, by granting permission to it, just like on our phones and we install an, a program or, or an app, we say like you can access the network, you can access the file system. Um, by doing that, you could then sort of have an analogy there where it determines which of these topics and services are visible in, the, uh, in this sort of micro app temporary namespace. Um, a manager program then would need to launch these things, probably to download them off the internet somewhere also, but then to create these temporary namespaces, destroy them when they're done. And then also, if we want to have a consistent set of topics available like map or odometry or whatever, um, we need to listen to whatever the particular robot is that we're porting this platform to, and then it's going to rebroadcast them, maybe mash up their data structure a little bit into something that is standard, at least we could claim will be the same on all, on all robots for all time. Okay, so now um, this is the most fun one. Um, this is pretty, pretty far out there crackpot-wise, uh, but the idea here is open and dynamic firmware, I like to call it. So usually in robotics, um, we have a bunch of software running, whether it's on, on a particular operating system. Um, in ROS, we have a driver node, which then talks to usually a driver library sitting on top of the operating system. That kind of does some magic, and then it talks to a black box piece of firmware that does more magic, and then we get data streams out of it at the end of the day. Um, so it's kind of a fun thought experiment to see, you know, what if we shake this up a little bit? Um, so this is kind of a cartoon of what I just said. We have a, uh, the orange box there is like kind of the Unix world, and there's a bunch of processes there. They send data to each other. Um, then kind of out of that box, there's these lines, these peripheral buses. Each widget will have its own peripheral bus that it lives on. Uh, and then they kind of do their own thing. Another way to look at this is, uh, is kind of like this. Basically, here's a world that we can do things in, we can be clever in, and then here's a world that we just sort of have to take as is. So it's interesting to think, uh, what if we change this a little bit? The way that this has handled right here, where we have this you know, world we don't control, oftentimes what manufacturers do is we put as little functionality as possible in the firmware, and then we try to then have it so that the, the host code can then do all sorts of crazy things on the host. And so then that makes the driver library get more complicated, but since it's easier to modify and update software than firmware, um, this tends to be a good trade-off to make. So it's interesting to then take a step back and say, well, let's look at the embedded system world a little bit. Last year was amazing. Uh, the first time ever more of these smartphones were sold than personal computers. Um, ARM-based microcontrollers are becoming common. They're becoming kind of everywhere. These, these are 32-bit machines with you know, pipelines and memory systems that are fast and all sorts of things. Um, and because of that, essentially, we can put more and more smarts into our robots, into the actual hardware, without adding cost or complexity anymore. I, I called my dad the other night. I asked him, uh, this is a computer we bought like in the early 90s or something. He said, what's funny, this is like 15 years ago, and he still remembered exactly how much he paid for it. It was so painful. This <laughs> $3,500 for a 60 megahertz Pentium, the original P5s. Uh, that same functionality, the like sort of 60 megahertz, 32-bit type machine, now is in an ARM system on chip. It's five millimeters square and it costs five dollars. Um, you know, the, obviously the computer had a hard disk. The single chip doesn't have a hard disk. But you know, the, in terms of just the actual 
count of MIPS of how many instructions we execute, um, they're, they're now becoming comparable with, with what we used to call computers is now a single chip device. Um, sort of a shameless plug here. So here's a, here's a hand, I brought a prop, props are fun. This is a hand I've been working on for a while. Um, it's a, a system, it has 13 of these ARM system on chips in it. So then if you look at all those kind of MIPS count together, you get to 1,000 MIPS. Um, every kind of link here, every finger, every uh, motor controller has, a, has its own ARM system on chip running in it. And so it's interesting to then think, what, we could, what can we actually do in this thing? Maybe I actually don't need to have an RTOS running on a host somewhere, maybe I can do all these functionality in the hardware itself. Um, every year these things get faster. So embedded systems are still enjoying this kind of exponential frequency scaling stuff that used to happen on desktops and was exciting. This is still happening on, uh, in, in the embedded world. So ARM microcontrollers, um, you know, whether they're called them microcontrollers or call them computers, whatever you want to, they get faster every year. Um, super phones, you know, every time you buy a new super phone, it's, it's better than your previous one, has more awesomeness. So if we can look at that as this now, we have this basically a bunch of embedded systems, we can tie them together and end up with a real computer. Maybe we can do the real-time needs of the system inside the hardware itself, as opposed to on an RTOS back on a PC. The advantage of doing that is if we have lots of little processors that are each quite powerful, it's in theory at least simple to configure them and, and get them running. And um, maybe less pain dealing with, with RTOSs and stuff. So modularity, um, the idea here we have on this hand is that these fingers essentially just separate off, so they're magnetically detached, and then each of them is essentially their own complete system. Um, but the point of this exercise is that each finger in and of itself has a one kilohertz real-time controller running inside of it, which means that the, the upstream connection can be quite low bandwidth and full of jitter and all sorts of bad things like that, but it's okay because the finger behavior is controlled by the, the on in the devices and the hardware, and it's always gonna hit its one time or one kilohertz control loop because it's not doing anything else. Okay, so that solves uh, one problem, I guess. It, the other problem, though, is once we start playing that game, it's hard to iterate. So um, the great thing about RTOS running on a real computer is you can actually have a real screen. You can you know, change the line of code, rebuild it, run it again, um, do all the great things we can do in software iteration. Uh, that's tricky in firmware, of course, and um, you know, typically in firmware, it's like you want to change the line of code. It's like, oh, okay, whatever. I'll pull this thing off. I'll stick a JTAG programmer on it, cross-compile. You know, hit, hit, hit program, you sort of walk to the water felt and you come back and it's going again. Um, that's painful. Um, I made this hand so that you can, there's bootloaders on each of these ARM microcontrollers. Um, all the internal power systems are, are switchable um, so that you can then sort of make, force everything to reset to a bootloader and reflash the whole thing. And that, that's fun. Um, and you can, you know, single shell script, you can program all the microcontrollers in the hand. It takes about a minute over Ethernet, 10 minutes over CAN bus. It's really exciting the first time it happens and it's just terrible every time after that. So the proposal here is to make what I call live firmware. So lots of firmware uh, gets burned into flash. There's kind of, at least the way I, I like to look at this world, there's, there's sort of two things. There's like the critical code that has to set up all the peripherals and stuff. It's super boring and you have to like read data sheets for hours on end and then you sort of get these obscure register settings and you sort of never change them ever again. Then there's the fun part, the interesting part, which is like the control loops, the, um, the other parts of maybe the, the packet generation. There's some things that's interesting to deal with. Um, but especially the, the, in our case as roboticists, the, the controllers. Um, oftentimes that's the part you want to tweak because once you get the sort of base, like bare metal stuff going, then that's just going to work. Um, the experimentation cycle, that's where it's painful. If you want to just change one line of like some control code, you don't want to have to then wait for your 10 minutes for all of your controllers to reflash. So the idea there is um, let's have, well first we'll be able to pr synchronize parameters to a ROS parameter server, that makes sense. The second part, the part I have in boldface at the bottom is dynamic code injection of this interesting part. So this is where it gets fully crackpot. But the idea here is that a ROS host, maybe you can ask your microcontroller, like where is some free memory that you have, spawn out a GCC linker script, which means you can, you can peg your object code to particular locations in memory, peg all of your memory segments as you want them, then cross compile, you have this binary blob now, and then just copy that thing into microcontroller memory and cast a function pointer and run it. Be awesome. So we'll see how this goes. But anyway, this is the proposal. <laughs> So there are some features that can help you now. Uh, these things we used to call microcontrollers are sort of every year they get looking more like a computer. They have memory protection units now. The super fancy ones have memory, or virtual memory, not all of them though. Um, you can have different classes of exception handlers for user mode and supervisor mode. So I, I think this might actually be possible. Uh, we'll see. Um, if it is possible, it'll be fun because you can then, now you can tweak things quickly. You can change the line of code, cross compile it, copy it into memory and you're, you're up and going again without this uh, long and arduous wait time. So at the end of the day, the idea is not only is it open source firmware, but it's actually live firmware, meaning that we can tweak things and run them again. 
just like we love doing in ROS systems. We can tweak a ROS node, you know, control C it, launch it again, and it's up and running. Um, maybe we can do the same with, with snippets of code in, in firmware itself. Okay, so I've talked about three kind of main ideas today. I've first talked about the past, the olden days of ROS. Um, some of the sources of inspiration, we have the STAIR project, Pier 1 at Stanford, the, uh, the player stage project. Lots of other ideas also kind of got thrown into a blender, and we ended up with, with ROS ideas at the end. Uh, I did a whirlwind kind of drive-by of, of some ROS functionality, uh, a fun slideshow, and then I just kind of went crackpot and, and had three fun ideas uh, for the future. So thanks, everyone, for all your time. Thanks for coming. Okay, sure. Uh, the question was, how can we compare what, what I was just kind of spouting off about this live firmware idea with things like Arduino, these, um, which, uh, in case you're not familiar with it, it's a very popular platform right now for, for dealing with small 8-bit microcontrollers, and I guess they're moving on into 32-bit ARM stuff now. You can plug this, it's a very low-cost modules you can plug into USB, and they have um, all the hardware in a nice IDE that you can sort of click go and, and it all happens. So um, it's a great question. First of all, let me try to think a little bit on how to respond to that reasonably. I think, I guess what I'm seeing here is that sometimes we don't need to flash the whole thing. If there's a complicated program running on the microcontroller, like for example, these, these finger microcontrollers I have, um, there's quite a bit going on in these things. There's a bootloader that runs, there's sort of the three second bootloader delay. There's um, a bunch of configuration that needs to happen to bring them up and to get them running. I guess what I was hoping is that we can sort of have an analog to a Unix process launch so that I mean, on a, on a big Unix machine, you have a bunch of these things running. Um, you can just sort of say, I want to run this piece of code now. We call it a process. It inserts an entry in a process table, and then it gets scheduled. And the idea would be, I guess, more similar to that. See if we can have kind of a micro version of a scheduler and an actual process table on these things. Um, be able to maybe switch them on and off, and almost like you're calling processes, if that makes sense. So it's sort of the equivalent, I guess, of, of installing a Unix process and launching it versus re-imaging a whole hard drive, if that makes sense. The question was, if we were to, to do things over, um, what, would we, what would we do differently? What, what could we add um, to the system? I suppose it would be good, and this can also be done retroactively, of course, to have kind of templates, if you will, that can impose structure on nodes that want structure. Um, I think it's always important to keep that optional, but sometimes one of the common uh, criticisms we hear is that there's not enough structure in ROS. I think it would be good to have sort of various levels of structure that you can add. Like you can have a node that complies with sort of feature spec, you know, XYZ or whatever, that sort of implements these hooks into it, and so then it behaves like other nodes. Um, there are other more structured frameworks out there that, that do this, and I think, it's a, I think it's a good thing. I think it's good to leave it optional, but I think that having sort of a sort of default set of, if you want to formalize things a little bit, here's how it could look. I think that that's a good thing to add. So the question is, um, I, I kind of spelled it off a bit about having, let's have more ROS masters and masters of masters and stuff. And the question is, can we just get rid of masters altogether? Uh, it's a great question. And I think that um, there are systems out there that do this. I think ZeroCon for Avahi, they tend to do this. You just sort of plug things into a network and then they send out discovery packets and periodically things discover each other and, and it's awesome. Um, I think that that's probably possible. I think one trick to that is that, uh, at least the stuff I've seen, and I'm not very experienced with zero conf, I'm sure there are people in this room that are far better than I. I've seen it mostly work on local network segments. Um, if you want to tie systems together over bigger, bigger hops, it, you can't just send a broadcast packet to the whole internet and hope that someone's gonna respond. Um, I think that there could be a balance there, maybe, of that local systems could find each other and, and configure each other. One thing that's good, though, about the, the master, one thing that's useful is the parameter server. And that, in that case, it really is just sort of needs to be a, a program that everyone can, can talk to and find for configuration. Um, but there could be some sort of a balance there that we could find, I guess. Good question. I, I don't really have a solid answer for that, as you can tell, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Question was, why am I still in school? Um, I'm working on that. Uh, we're getting close. Thanks for the question. <laughs> okay, great, thanks. The question, I guess, the question there, if I understand it correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, is that can we implement security at the master layer? Or are there things we can do to improve the security? Okay, great.
Yeah, that's a good idea. I, um, that's a good idea. We could maybe use this layer to be what actually Im improves the security. Right now, ROS is pretty open. Uh, any process can connect to any other process. You say that I want to subscribe to a camera feed, it'll just give it to you. It doesn't ask who you are and do you have a certificate, if you should see that. Um, that's a good, good idea. We could use the, uh, essentially, local masters maybe on each process, or on each, um, each host, and then when it's time to link hosts together, maybe that's where we can impose security restrictions and actually try to maybe talk to a person that knows something about computer security and, and try to do the, the right thing there. That's great. Thanks. <laughs> so the question there is, should everything be implemented in ROS? Um, that would be scary. <laughs> okay, so there, there are things ROS does well, there are things ROS doesn't do as well. So currently, I guess the biggest hole is the, the real-time needs. There are robots in the world that need real-time performance. Um, they run on RTOSs on, you know, industrial boxes that look all hardcore with bolts on them and stuff. Um, they, that probably is good to keep that thing locked down tight by the people that build that robot. It's good to have that thing respond every millisecond with a new update. Um, I think in systems like that, that's, that's great to tighten that down all the way. And then it's nice to run sort of our, our freewheeling uh, fun system on top. I think there are other systems that, uh, we could, that also don't fit ROS very well. Um, the microcontroller world, it's hard. So, so one of the assumptions built in ROS is that every node's running an XML RPC server for configuration. Uh, you can't do that in like four kilobytes of RAM. I mean, it would be awesome. Maybe someone can, but I, I can't anyway. Um, I think there are, there are other worlds and other sort of domains in which it might make more sense to have a lighter weight framework. And we've tried pretty hard to keep ROS lightweight, but I think there's a sort of lightweight as a relative term. And uh, as processors scale down to tinier and tinier, it's, it's hard to keep that the same. Uh, 